Welcome back to Shannon's Club TV, the program for all motoring enthusiasts to relive some classic Australian road and race memories. In each episode, we profile our feature car, find out what made it a standout in Australia, and take a road trip in an owner's example. We'll also get up-to-date market news from the Shannon's auctions team. In today's episode, the twin turbo sports car that represents the pinnacle of Mazda's rotary engine development, the third generation RX-7. The third generation twin turbo Mazda RX-7 represented a much greater leap forward than its predecessor. While the first RX-7 was a true Japanese original, the model introduced here in 1986, the second generation, was too heavily influenced by the Porsche 944. And until it was offered with a turbocharger, it was no quicker than the original, with the 17 seconds flat standing 400 metres time. While the second generation P747 Mazda RX-7 shadowed the Porsche 944, the third generation car was freelancing out on its own into the realm of being a dedicated, no compromises sports car. The centre of gravity was an inch lower, the engine was pushed rearwards to achieve 50-50 weight distribution, there was no pretense of room even for occasional rear occupants. The boot was minuscule. Neither was the new model ever to be offered as a convertible. Mazda's message was unmistakable. Real sports cars are two-seaters with room for a pair of toothbrushes. And didn't this third gen RX-7 go? I can testify firsthand from competing in the 1992 James Hardy 12 hour that no car loomed anywhere near as quickly in the Citroen BX's rear view mirrors than the twin turbo RX-7. Mark, was Mazda Australia's decision to take the RX-7 racing an unqualified success, would you oh, say? Yeah, you would have to say. It was, it was incredible. And I think a lot of the credit has to go to Mazda Australia's competition manager at the time, Alan Horsley. He was uh, also team manager of Alan Moffat's factory RX-7 team in the Group C days. And he was just a very smart operator. Yeah, he was brilliant at product planning, and he just knew how to bring together the right mix of mechanics and drivers and tacticians to achieve you know, the desired result. He really was pivotal in the RX-7 success. The classic 13B rotary received a major rework, and the use of sequential twin turbochargers was a work of engineering genius. Power to weight was phenomenal. Australian delivered third gen RX-7s weighed 1310 kilos with the toothbrushes and made 176 kilowatts but there was much potential remaining to be exploited. Mazda Australia's Alan Horsley developed his SP homologation special in 1995 and managed to extract 204 kilowatts while boosting torque from 294 all the way to 367 newton metres. It was enough to beat pricier Porsches in competition on the track. All Gen 3 RX-7s are becoming collectible, but the SPs are highly prized. In summary, these cars represent the high point to date of Mazda's ongoing endeavours with the Wankel rotary engine. Its 21st century RX-8 successor has never established such an enviable reputation and is now beginning to look as if it was a move in the wrong direction. In 1991, the twin-turbo RX-7 was a truly astonishing achievement. Mark, are we ever likely to see a Mazda rotary racing successor to the RX-7? Well, I'd certainly like to think so, and certainly based on the extraordinary success of the third generation RX-7. Mazda's twin turbocharged third generation, or FD, RX-7 dominated the annual Bathurst 12-hour race in the early 1990s. With such monotonous and demoralising efficiency, it could be argued it hastened the demise of the much-loved endurance event for series production cars. The first of Mazda's three consecutive mountain wins came in 1992, thanks to the combined driving talents of Charlie O'Brien, Gary Walden and Mark Gibbs. 
The following year, Formula One champ Alan Jones brought his formidable skills and experience, co-driving with Gary Walden to win Mazda's second Bathurst 12-hour in fine style. The other works car shared by O'Brien and Greg Hansford finished runner-up for an emphatic 1-2 against quality Porsche 968 opposition. Neil Crompton teamed with Hansford to win the fourth and final 12-hour race in 1994. It also exposed a rare chink in the RX-7's formidable armour when the second works car shared by Walden and Mark Scaife retired with engine trouble. Even so, it also proved the wisdom of Mazda's two-car strategy as it once again denied Porsche's 968 a prized victory. John, those two Bathurst victories over the 968, you know, that must have really stung some Porsche enthusiasts, wouldn't well, it? Well, I think so, because the 968 had a dedicated club sport variant. Exactly. Like it was built for the racetrack, whereas the RX-7 that they started out with was, mm. was just the production car. Well, I remember at the time when they announced they were running the 968s at Bathurst, you, know, you just thought, you looked at the specifications of that car, a stripped out lightweight competition special with huge brakes, great fuel economy. It looked like they would have them on the ropes, but Mazda did it again. And I have to say, as a road car, that 968 Club Sport was a magnificent, fantastic. you drive fantastic balance, yeah. a much better handling car than the RX-7. So mm. well, it really is a phenomenal story, the mm. RX-7 beating that 968 Club Sport. Yeah, it must have really stung. Mazda's victory in the first and only Eastern Creek 12-hour in 1995 was arguably the most significant of its four consecutive 12-hour wins, as it was achieved against a theoretically superior Porsche rival by using a locally developed homologation special called the RX-7 SP, or Special Project. The catalyst for the SP was Porsche's decision to import a small batch of its lightweight and extremely fast 911 RSCS, or Club Sport. Mazda Australia, guided by cunning competition's boss Alan Horsley, committed to a limited build of FD RX-7 SPs, with the letters SP representing almost 130 modifications to the standard car to make it more than a racing match for the German thoroughbred. Mazda once again denied Porsche a 12-hour triumph, with Dick Johnson and John Bow claiming a strategically brilliant victory in their works-entered SP, capping a perfect four 12-hour wins from four starts for the incredible twin-turbo RX-7. Remember to join the Shannons Club, where you can connect with other enthusiasts around the country. My name's Deb, and this is my beautiful Series 7 RX-7. It's a 1997 model. It's the last batch that came into Australia. This is all completely standard. I haven't done anything to it. Um, so it's as it came out of the factory. I got this car in 2000. I had a uh, Series 3 RX-7, and I had that for eight or nine years. So for quite a while, probably two or three years, I had two RX-7s in my garage, which was really nice. So this was my toy car. Um, friends refer to it as the Batgirl car. And the other one was my everyday drive. It, you know, every now and then I think I don't really need this second car. And I go for a drive and think, no, nah, not selling it ever. I've been a Shannon's customer for about three or four years and they're really good because they understand what your car is worth to you, it's not just a car and I find them really easy to deal with and I was pretty thrilled when they rang me and asked me if I wanted to get involved with this project. I think it's just so nice to drive. It holds the road, it's like it's glued to the road, it's like it's on rails and just cruising around the corners and you've got heaps of acceleration, you know, it's just awesome to drive. Just so much fun. I grew up in a family that has always liked fast cars and racing and we always watched Alan Moffat in Bathurst and when he moved to Mazda, it was sort of a natural thing to follow him in the Mazdas and I fell in love with the RX-7s then and I've always liked them ever since. Future plans for the car, well, I'll just keep driving it. I'll keep it in the garage under its cover and bring it out on nice fine days um, when there's not too many people around. It's pretty awesome, they're going for a cruise, that's what's really fun in a car like this.
Shannon's National Auctions Manager Chris Borobon joins us with an update on the third generation Mazda RX-7. Welcome, Chris. Welcome, mate. This Hi. is uh, this is a really interesting car, and without doubt, you know, the ultimate expression of the 13B rotary. I think it was yeah. the first time that we saw a, a twin se sequential turbocharger set up come out of Japan. So mm. it was it was a very very advanced car, wasn't it? It was. I think it's a shape that really uh, you know was re well accepted here when mm. it was released. Uh, I think it got a lot Beautiful of the rotary looking. enthusiasts oh, uh, excited. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, very good looking car. Yeah. And today, you know, we've seen the car make a real comeback. It's uh, mm. you know some of the special models have, have really uh, come well, up in value and. Uh, the, the icing on that particular automotive cake is the SP, the, the SP, fabulous right. SP, yep, yep. of which there were 26 20 road cars built. 29 in total, yep. and 26, I think, were allocated as the road cars. So mm. that's not very hard for an enthusiast to, <laughs> no, to keep track of no. you know, just over two dozen cars. Yeah. Uh, look, I would think the survival rate on those SPs would be fairly high. Mm. Uh, we've seen a couple come through to auction recently and uh, performed extremely Good well. Good prices, yeah. Um, the key is to find an original car that yeah. hasn't been tampered with or modified. I think that's what the collectors are looking for in an SP. Yeah. Would anyone know what happened to the car that won the 1995 Eastern Creek 12 hour race? Does that car still exist? Do we know? It, uh, do it does. Yeah, yeah. It does. Yeah. And, and they're still, that's still around. Mm. Uh, yeah, the Triple M car there. Yeah, the race cars yeah. are greatly celebrated yeah. by that but company. They, yeah. yeah. I mean, they're really favoured, you know, really favoured by JDM enthusiasts today, these yeah. cars. And, um, you know, I think I think we're seeing a generation that appreciated those cars when they were new and now coming into their own and, and being able to afford those cars. And then, are many of these cars still original, not not, not too yeah, modified or tampered be, with? Are they still... Yeah, but I'm just saying beyond the SPs, yep. uh, just a, a standard... You know, third generation RX-7. Is it that hard to find now? Because I imagine most of them would have been modified in some way. Yeah, a lot of them are modified. I mean, we, we've seen plenty of them on the show scene over the years, mm. you know, through uh, custom car shows. And, okay. and, you know, they've had the, you know, change of colours, uh, big stereos put into them. Mm. Um, so yeah. what's the acceptance of that amongst the Japanese car scene? Are they, Look, it seems to be. I think, I think there are enthusiasts for the modified, okay. customised RX-7s. Uh, mm. And there's also then uh, the enthusiasts who want the original cars. And you know, But they're the ones looking for those special models, uh, whether mm. it's ESP or the Spirit Rs or oh, you know, okay. any of those type um, of yeah. things. Yeah. What advice would you give someone who wants to get a really good one of these cars? Where would he or she start to look? Look, I think I think a lot of the, uh, the that third generation RX sevens are mainly in the classifieds. Uh, mm. Some of it for, would be through the clubs as well. And again, I think it's all about the maintenance of those cars uh, because we Critical. know what rotary motors are oh, like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it really is making sure that the car has been well maintained, well looked after. It hasn't really copped a hard time over uh, in its lifetime, yeah. and that's probably the important part of it. Well, that's excellent. Thank you very Thanks, much man. for joining Not us, guys. Christoph. And remember, you can get all the latest auction news on the Shannon's Club website. If you'd like a lasting image of the third generation RX-7 racing, visit the archive at autopix.com.au. You know, a lot of the conversation about the, the FD RX-7 is its racing successes. And I, history has tended to overshadow all the stories about the car on the road, which is what it was designed for. Yes, I have to say that uh, driven hard, it could be a little bit skittish, the RX-7, not much rear suspension travel, mm. and it was a bit all or nothing. I, I had the great pleasure of driving it in company with the Honda NSX, mm. and in a straight line, the RX-7 would hose off the Honda, mm. at least up to you know ridiculously high speeds. But mm. in terms of handling and finesse and balance, the NSX was in a class above it. Mm. So it was a flawed masterpiece, really, I think, the RX-7. And there was certainly, like with the styling, the second generation RX-7 was criticised for its Porsche copying. Yes. But that, the styling of the third generation was distinctly different again and very unique to it that was, brand. It was neater, I think, yes, and a very distinctive car, mm. certainly. Yeah, yes. very memorable too. Yep. We hope you've enjoyed looking back on the sensational third generation RX-7 and we'll catch you next time on Shannon's Club TV.